Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. My name is Cassandra Morris. I'm a project officer with the Green Municipal Funds Capacity Development Team. And I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Kiana and Sharon, who are project coordinators, and we'll be doing all the behind the scenes producer work today. This webinar is part of our GMF webinar series, where every month we feature thematic presentations focused on GMF programs. This month's presentation is entitled An Introduction to District Energy. Before we dive in, a few housekeeping items to get through. Uh, first and foremost, today's presentation is in English, but we do have an interpreter uh, interpretation services available. Please join me in clicking the interpretation button, uh, which is the globe icon in the lower right of your screen. When you click it, options for French and English should show up. Please select the language of your choice and you'll want to stay in that channel. A special thanks to our amazing interpreter who will be working hard today to make this possible. Aujourd'hui, nous avons des présentations en anglais. Si vous souhaitez écouter en Today, français, presentations will be in English. If you want to listen in le English, bouton please click on the globe icon. Uh, sorry, I'm pausing because I'm hearing the interpretation. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I'm in the wrong channel or if um, the interpretation's in the wrong channel. Um, I'm just going to quickly stop sharing for just a moment because I want to make sure and then I'll share again. You're all good, Cassie. It's just because you're in the English channel. So just uh, push through. Okay. You be all for the right. rest. Sorry. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, all right. Yes, so si vous souhaitez écouter en français, veuillez cliquer sur le bouton d'interprétation en bas à droite de votre écran. Uh, you can click on the globe globe. icon at the Sélectionnez uh, l'option française. Notre interprète s'assure que le contenu est toujours uh, accessible English, dans la langue uh, de votre choix. The uh, interpreter will make sure that interpretation is done in your language of choice. I will introduce the topic and then each of our presenters has prepared a 15 minute presentation to share with you today. We're going to run through each presentation one after the other and use our remaining time for discussion and Q&A at the end. There is a Q&A box so you can use that uh, during the question and answer period. The chat box is also available if you want to share any resources, comments, or if you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the presentation. You are welcome to ask questions or comment in the language of your choice. Before we dive into the agenda, I would like to first start off by acknowledging that we are meeting on the lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been First Peoples who have been stewards of what we now call Canada. And so we would like to recognize the Algonquin at Anishinaabe people that uh, as the traditional custodians of the land upon which FCM offices are located, as well as where my current home office is located. We deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and all First Nations, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular and our country as a whole. I encourage everyone to take a moment to reflect on where you are presently and the stewards of that place. So for today, we're going to start with an introduction to district energy. We'll go over some of the benefits and some of the barriers. Then I'm going to introduce our presenters. We are grateful to have them with us today. Jeff Salazar is the Director of Energy Solutions at Alexicon Group, and Samir Baines is the Engineering Project Manager for Renewable Energy Systems Infrastructure Delivery at the City of Edmonton. After we hear from the speakers, we'll have 10 minutes for questions and answers. I ask that you please direct questions to the Q&A box and keep comments in the resources, uh, in the comments and resources chat. Uh, and then we'll have 10 minutes presentation from our very own Noemi, an advisor in our programs and outreach team about GMF funding opportunities in this area. In case you are new to FCM, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is the national voice of local governments in Canada. 
FCM's mandate includes delivering programs that build municipalities capacity to do what they do best, deliver and innovate innovative, cost-effective local solutions to environmental challenges and to enhance the quality of life for their citizens. The Green Municipal Fund is our largest program and it's funded by the Government of Canada. It has a double mandate to support municipal initiatives and sustainable development through funding, so GMF funding offers, and uh, share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, trainings, peer learnings, and networking activities. And that's where the capacity development team comes in, so me and my colleagues, and it's where the impetus behind this webinar and others like it come from. There are five sector focus areas in GMF, but today our topic of district energy systems comes from GMF's focus on promoting sustainable energy solutions. We're going to hear from two presenters on their experience, but in only one hour we cannot possibly cover everything, uh, so we would like to follow up post webinar with a few additional resources that we expect you'll also find helpful on this topic. Without further ado, let's begin by addressing the question, what is district energy systems and what are some of the benefits and barriers to adoption? District energy or district heating and cooling is the utilization of one or more community energy source to provide energy services to multiple users. This approach can replace individual building based furnaces, air conditioning units, boilers and chillers. District energy systems are versatile in that they can utilize many different locally available energy sources and they can provide heating and cooling and if linked to an electricity generating facility power. Thermal energy in the form of hot water steam or chilled water can be distributed through underground pipes from the energy source to several buildings and returned to be heated or cooled again. There are many benefits to district energy systems. I'm just gonna go over a few today, but please note that this is not an exhaustive list and you will hear more from our presenters as well. First, they free up the building owners from needing to own and maintain individual boilers, chillers, <laughs> building-based furnaces and AC, as I had mentioned in uh, the previous slide. But second, these are flexible operating systems. They can connect multiple buildings in various orientations. They can be built upon and extended, and they can run over a variety of energy sources, run on a variety of energy sources. They can impact positively a community's economic situation by using affordable or even free energy sources. They also free up space in mechanical rooms, and that space can be reallocated in the design process. District energy systems reduce greenhouse gas emissions by replacing less efficient equipment in individual buildings with more efficient central, a more efficient central power plant and by producing electricity for the central grid that can displace, for example, coal fired and other electricity sources that involve higher greenhouse gas emissions per kilowatt hour. Finally, they can harness already locally available and abundant energy sources. Despite all of the advantages, there are still some barriers to adoption. First, the upfront cost of installing the infrastructure can be a deterrent for some. Thankfully, we will hear from Noemi later about some of the funding opportunities that can help overcome that barrier. There is still a fair amount of educating that needs to happen on the benefits, functionality, and efficiency of district energy systems, hence webinars like this one, but I'm sure there's a lot more resources as well. Um, that uh, we will try to make available <laughs> a post webinar. And uh, finally, the industry is still somewhat young in Canada. In some countries, district energy systems have become common practice, making development fast and efficient. However, Canada is on its way to normalizing this type of energy system as more and more projects are implemented like the ones we're gonna hear about today. And before I pass things off to our presenters today, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Sapperton District Energy System in New Westminster, BC, as another example to read up on in your spare time. My colleague uh, Sharon will share the link in the chat to the case study that GMF published last year, which highlights a feasibility study and a plan to use waste heat from the Metro Vancouver sewer system to provide heating and cooling to a hospital as well as a residential uh, retail community and commercial facilities. So without further ado, I 
it is with great pleasure that I open the floor to Jeff Salazar, the Director of Energy Solutions at Alexicon, as he talks about the project that he is working on in Whitby. I will stop sharing my slides now, and Jeff, you can introduce yourself and uh, share your slides. Thanks, Cassandra, and welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Jeff Salazar. I am the Director of Energy Solutions here at Alexicon Group. We are a municipally owned and uh, unregulated energy um, let's call it consulting and services business. So we do a number of different technologies and services for uh, all of our clients. So today I'm going to speak with you about our North Whippy district energy system. It is a Z zero carbon. Uh, just want to confirm, Cassandra, you can see the screen? Yes. Uh Perfect. Uh, so I'm just going to go into presentation mode here. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the North Whitby Zero Carbon District Energy System that we are working on uh, jointly with the town of Whitby here in Durham Region, Ontario. Um, so it is a geo exchange, low carbon district energy system. We started looking at this with the town of Whitby, I'm going to guess about 2019. So it is a bit of a long process. Uh, we're coming to the final stages of design and implementing the system with construction starting later this year. Um, so we jointly worked with the town of Whitby to explore this opportunity. We knew there was a, um, a corporate target from the town for zero net zero carbon by 2040. Um, so we entered into an agreement uh, and our feasibility study that we did over the last year and a half, two years, uh, was partially funded by GMF through the FCM channels, uh, which was greatly appreciated. It helped cover some of the cost of, of exploring this opportunity. Um, and this, this facility or this system is basically going to provide heating, cooling, and domestic hot water for a new development area in North Whitby here, um, which includes this Whitby Sports Complex, a large net zero energy uh, recreational facility that has ice rinks and um, ice rinks and Olympic sized pool and some other facilities recreationally. Um, and then it will also expand out to provide uh, heating and cooling for the additional development lands to the east of that facility. Um, so we were we were targeting net zero. So we had already had the intention of going with geo exchange, which is a low carbon, no carbon solution. Um, but the, the the outputs coming out of the feasibility study were an, a, te a technical analysis on the feasibility, the constructability of this application, um, some of the site specifics, uh, estimating what the heating and cooling loads would be for the building, and of course, uh, assessing what the capital and operating costs would be associated with putting a system in like this. We also did an economic and um, environmental analysis on potential GHG emissions reductions uh, by implementing this system, and we did come up with a uh, pre-feasibility or feasibility level uh, concept design which I'm going to go over shortly. So this is our, our feasibility design, um, highlighting the basically the components of the system. So we have on the left-hand side there, the bore field in red dots, uh, which will basically create a thermal battery for us to move heat, heating and cooling to and from the earth and store it for short periods or longer periods of time. Uh, that would connect into an energy center, which then distributes that low temperature fluid through the, through the community and connects into each building. Uh, each building would have an energy transfer station, which would consist of uh, a number of components that would basically convert that low temperature energy coming to and from the ground into usable thermal energy, and or it would reject the heat from the buildings through the heat, the heat pump system back into the district system, where it can then be shared further down the line and or stored back in the bore field for use later on. Um, so it's, it's a, a very flexible system, but um, does have a number of moving components. It does have a high capital cost. So one of the key outputs from that feasibility study was the staging of the project to align capital deployment with our revenue uh, revenue coming in from connected customers. So we've split the project into two main phases. First one being the installation of the bore field and the energy center, which will distribute throughout the, the development and connection into that uh, community center or rec center from the town of Whitby. Uh, which is the first building that's being built on this uh, overall larger development. As we get that connected and continue operating, we'll see revenues and energy uh, transactions between us and, and the recreation center uh, as the rest of the development builds out. And then we'll expand the system later on to connect to the future buildings um, and, and move on from there. So uh, the, basically the system consists of, as I mentioned, a geo exchange loop, uh, a heat exchanger, 
uh, which separates the loop field from the distribution system to prevent any contamination and provide some serviceability of that system. If anything goes wrong with the distribution piping, we can isolate that heat exchanger that's in the ground and not have to, da not have to damage it or potentially repair or make changes to it. Uh, the system does use an ambient fluid throughout the ground. So it's a low temperature, um, low grade heat that's, that's distributed through this piping. And it provides us flexibility to incorporate additional technologies further down the road as we expand the system to larger, uh, larger service, a uh, larger service area. So we can incorporate uh, sewage waste heat recovery in here. We can add in solar thermal technology to supplement on the heating side. Uh, very flexible by using that ambient system and having distributed heat pumps throughout the community that would then boost that heat or reject capture the rejected heat from the from the buildings and send it back into the system. Um, so again, a key key area on this, uh, a key focus area for us on this was the education piece to Cassandra's point earlier. Um, this is a relatively new technology, uh, new application in Canada. So we've, we've developed our energy center similar to what Samir's going to mention uh, for the Blatchford community. We've developed a showcase uh, energy center where we can bring in post-secondary students, municipal stakeholders, et cetera, and really show them uh, what this system's doing, what it's capable of, and how the what the benefits of that system are. So the energy center is going to be an architectural piece in the center of the Whitby Sports Complex lands that can be accessed by public at any time. We'll also have tours, et cetera. Uh, and it would contain basically circulation pumps and the main district energy connections to that distribution system. Um, we talked a little bit about the distribution network that goes through the system. It's a two-pipe ambient temperature heating and cooling system. So we're distributing low temperature fluid throughout and interconnecting it to the buildings. Um, this provides us the ability to both have simultaneous heating and cooling at the different locations that are connected and allows a real, really large amount of flexibility. These pipings would be installed adjacent to the roadway that's being built through this community in a road allowance that's been provided to us by the town of Whitby. Um, again, back, back to the building side of it, we are providing the full energy transfer system uh, station basically inside each building. So that would include ground source or water source heat pumps, uh, peaking electric boilers for supplementing that heating load and domestic hot water. Um, and this would typically be located either in an individual room in each building or incorporated into the building's main mechanical room, where we would then transfer that energy coming from our system into the building and they could distribute it as they need. Um, so the, we've we've spoken with the developers and they, they're making uh, precautions or, or preparing for uh, hydronic based heating systems typically, um, which work really well with this low temperature heat pump application. Um, so again, to, to Cassandra's point earlier, these systems are not new. The technology has been in Europe for hundreds of years. We actually have systems here in Ontario that are approaching 100 years as old as well. Um, so the, the newer generation of, of district energy systems are becoming more prevalent, but there is still that education piece uh, to educate municipalities, stakeholders, et cetera, to get them familiar with what is actually going on. These are just a couple examples. Uh, the Edmonton one, Samir is going to talk about very shortly, which is an exciting project that we've all been following here in the industry. Um, so some of the major benefits, as, as Cassandra mentioned, um, ideally, with that carbon and sustainability goal that the town had, we looked at geo exchange because it has the potential to reduce emissions by up to 96%. We've estimated based on our study um, that's compared to business as usual, natural gas heating uh, and domestic hot water production, and then electric air conditioning for cooling and, and process um, equipment inside of each of the buildings. So there's that carbon reduction benefit certainly is there. Improved air quality that's associated with the lack of emissions coming from the fuel stacks of, of the fossil-based uh, heating equipment. Um, it does also provide some security or resilience against the fluctuating commodity costs associated with natural gas. Uh, gas has doubled essentially from last year to this time now. Um, so by leveraging that high efficiency, 400% efficiency on, on geo exchange solutions, we're able to mitigate some of those fluctuations in the commodity costs by and also sharing waste heat. So the, the community center, for example, has a large ice rink facility that rejects a significant amount of waste heat coming off that refrigeration process. So instead of wasting that up through an air cooler out to the atmosphere, 
we're actually able to collect that through our heat pump system and redistribute it down through the, the distribution piping to other clients' uh, connected buildings where they can use that free waste heat uh, at a very low cost. So again, mitigating some of the energy costs associated with the, the fluctuating commodities. Um, again, we're, we're leveraging a showpiece in the community with that, that um, energy center, and we're creating local jobs both through from architectural to construction aspects and then the ongoing operation and maintenance of this system. Um, overall, it will have a, a competitive life, life cycle cost compared to gas-based heating systems, um, and we're, we're not going to get into the, the economics today, but um, definitely competitive as we start getting these multiple technologies and the scale really helps. Um, so some other, other benefits uh, to the developers and the communities, again, reliable thermal energy distribution. We're operating this similar to a, a gas utility. We own and operate all of the equipment. We provide that service guarantee. We will have technicians on site to ensure you're getting the energy you need. Um, meter building equipment, uh, to Cassandra's point, gas furnaces, boilers, chillers, those are all on our, on our bill now. So we're owning and operating that reduce capital costs for the developer, uh, in developers in the site, lower operating and maintenance costs because we're managing a good portion of that heating equipment and longer lifespans on, on heat pump systems just in general compared to fossil-based systems. Um, so the maintenance costs are lower. And again, back to that thermal energy price stability, uh, we're managing that aspect. So we're able to optimize the system and, and drive that operating cost lower um, each year. So some of the risks and challenges, these systems are not uh, without their, their challenges, certainly. Um, we found in this process, the hardest part about district energy systems is actually getting started. Once you wrap your head around the system and start investigating it um, and, and looking at the opportunity, uh, it becomes much easier to, to swallow and to provide uh, education to the, to the clients and potential cust customers connecting. Um, they do have a long lead time. So we started this in 2019, I believe, were the initial discussions uh, through pre-feasibility, feasibility, and now detailed design. Uh, we're three years in, plus or minus the, the COVID interruptions, um, and we're looking to break ground starting later this summer with an anticipated construction timeline of two years for the phase one, um, and then phase two would be immediately after that. Um, so one of the key aspects to district systems is having an anchor tenant or critical mass of connected buildings so that we know that we're going to be able to generate those revenues and have a sustainable system that's not capitally intensive on day one. Um, and, and one of the biggest challenges we had was stakeholder buy-in and overcoming what we call the status quo bias. So this level of scrutiny that's placed on these newer, more sophisticated technology solutions um, needs to be placed on business as usual as well. So if you can get in front of your potential connected customers and the stakeholders and show them the value and the levelized cost of energy associated with going with business as usual, um, it really opens some eyes to the developer community to, to really scrutinize their, their business as usual case as, as in as much detail as they are our alternative systems, which is a low carbon district energy system. Um, the, the large capital requirements are certainly certainly a challenge as well. But again, by phasing that in uh, and allocating capital or deploying capital in line with potential revenue streams, it, it just helps mitigate some of those risks from a financial perspective to get this system uh, deployed, operating and, and working uh, as planned. So uh, my screen's blank, but I don't know how my time is. How am I doing for time, Cassandra? Um, you are doing, you're at 12 minutes. You have three Perfect. minutes left. Yeah. So overall it's been, it's been a great process. Um, we, we do have developer buy-in, which was challenging to get initially. Um, but once we highlighted some of those challenges, uh, that we overcame and, and the benefits to them in the longer term, uh, the project is moving forward. So we are starting phase one, as I mentioned later this summer with the community center being the first connected customer. And then as the uh, development continues on, we'll be expanding it. Uh, because of the modular approach and the low temperature ambient system, we're actually looking at expanding this to another 200 acre development to the west of this property, which is slated to have high tech industrial and manufacturing processes. So the, the, the city's really leveraging this low carbon net zero technology to drive in new economic development in the town of Whitby by bringing in, uh, you know, high tech, uh, green energy, low carbon manufacturers of, you know, wh whatever it may be 
um, we feel it's a it's a nice um, showcase piece to, to drive that economic development into the town. So there's a number of benefits. They certainly outweigh the the challenges, and the challenges are not 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 insurmountable by any means. Um, but certainly, getting started was the hardest part, and and uh, the long lead time. So so prepare yourselves for that. And if you guys have any questions or um, inquiries about our system or how we're developing it, please. Don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I believe Cassandra is going to provide my contact information at the end of the webinar. So thank you for your time and uh, looking forward to hearing what Samir has to say about his Blatchford community. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I'll pass things off to Samir now, the engineering project management manager for the city of Edmonton. Um, Samir, if you want to just share your screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay, is everyone able to see my screen? Yes, and feel okay. free to, I'll just mention, feel free to drop your questions and comments in the chat. I have noticed a couple comments. I'll bring them up when we get to the Q&A period, but um, everyone feel free to populate them as they come to you. Sorry, uh, Samira, back to you. Okay, perfect. So my screen's good, everything's good. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, morning, afternoon, everyone, uh, depending on the part of the country you guys are tuned in from. My name is Samir Baines. I'm the engineering uh, PM for the Blatchford Renewable Energy Utility Team here based out of uh, Edmonton, Alberta. And uh, today I will be guiding you through our challenges. And it was, it's, it's really nice to see that Jeff's challenges that we had faced in the past are not very different. So that's, that's and we're all in this together and, um, uh, I hope to shed some more light on how we've overcome and what we have done here in Edmonton um, to make this project. So, uh, oh, Samir, I'm not sure what happened, but your audio is just getting quieter and quieter. <laughs> oh, can you hear me okay now? Yes, I think maybe your arm was maybe blocking the. Okay, perfect. I'll keep them away. Um, so, again, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, so back in 2008, um, our city council uh, began the discussion of potentially redeveloping the land of an operating municipal airport. The photo that you see on the left is actually um, the lands of the old airport that we have here. And um, so 08 was when the discussions actually started. And then slowly through the years um, with the discussions and a lot of debating, uh, the airport was uh, closed in 2013, and then in 2014, the uh, council approved a development plan to transform this prime land and real estate um, into a community that will be focused on sustainable um, development. And one, frankly, that would also act as a catalyst for transformational land development and path to a more resilient future. Um, so as a result of that, in 2010, uh, the council also set up the vision for the community, um, which was that Blatchford, which is the name of the community, um, will be home to up to 30,000 Edmontonians living, working, and learning in a sustainable community that uses 100% renewable energy, is carbon neutral, and also significantly reduces its ecological footprint, and finally empowers the residents uh, to pursue a wide range of sustainable lifestyle choices. Um, as you've probably um, read and are thinking that this vision uh, clearly demonstrates a significant leadership um, that the council showed. And uh, especially when um, you consider that this vision was put in place almost a decade uh, prior to declaring the climate emergency. Um, but once the vision was set in place, uh, the council positioned the city administration as the land developer of the site. And then the city staff were tasked to bringing this vision to life. Samir, sorry to interrupt you here. Um, uh, the interpreter can't hear you. I'm wondering if you are in the uh, main channel or did you end up switching to the English channel? No, I'm in the... Sorry, I'm in the main channel. The main channel. Hmm, okay, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the issue is. 
Um, okay. Is there anything I need to go back to here and update? Oh, okay. No, I guess it's the microphone. I'm not, maybe just speak a little closer to the mic if that's okay. Sorry, I just got the, the notification. Okay, uh, no carry on. Apologies for the interruption, everyone. No problem. Um, so uh, clearly we cannot talk about sustainability and resiliency without addressing the um, energy uh, question. So to reduce the energy uh, in a community, you first have to um, clearly understand what the energy sources are. So as you can see from the pie chart on your left, uh, the homes and buildings um, account for 37.6% of the energy usage in Edmonton, uh, which is significant. Um, based off of this, uh, this then equates to uh, 5.8 million tons of uh, CO2 emitted every year. Um, so this clearly means that in any community, which is going to be primarily um, homes and buildings, we need to focus on reducing the energy uh, as the first step and then using renewables if we want to make it even more sustainable. So as part of that, um, uh, the city of Edmonton um, being the owner of the land uh, started to invest in the system uh, to meet the vision of the community and to also um, start the process of reducing the GHG emissions. And our modeling um, essentially showed that homes and buildings in Blatchford um, will be emitting 70% 5, 75% uh, um, fewer GHGs uh, than a typical that's typical neighborhood outside of um, Blatchford or BAU case. And then at a full build out, uh, it is um, anticipated to save about 30,000 tons of GHG emissions. So essentially the entire neighborhood's heating and cooling needs will be met by renewable energy system. And then now the biggest uh, question was how to tackle the GHG emissions um, from this community. As a result, there were three pillars that were developed. First one being the conservation, second one being the efficiency, third one being renewable. So the first one essentially is that we need to be able to build uh, high performance buildings because that's what we need to reduce the amount of energy usage at. So to address this, uh, Blatchford team developed its own green building codes, uh, which ensure that within the development, the vision for energy conservation and sustainability was met. Secondly, efficiency, which meant implementation of a just energy sharing system, uh, including the ground source heat pumps uh, and the geo sources was also created and providing residents with the heating, cooling and hot water services. And then lastly, uh, you can't complete the whole process without incorporation of the renewable energy sources, such as your geo exchange, sewer heat exchanges, and then the solar PVs as a primary source of thermal energy to future uh, to further reduce the GHG emissions. Then came the implementation piece. So a lot of technical work had gone into uh, into into this um, before the uh, city essentially landed on using a this energy sharing system. Um, some of the some of the factors that were very influential in this um, consisted of site context and simply the history that's connected back to it, and then the Edmonton's climate because we see uh, a fluctuation all the way from minus forty to plus forty in Edmonton, and then a bigger question as Jeff also pointed out the financial barriers or the financial implications of it very uh, cost heavy, very capital intensive uh, investments. And then clearly the GHG emission targets and then emerging technologies in the sense that we kept the door open uh, using a nimble approach to be able to incorporate any new uh, technologies that we could incorporate in the future as the uh, development took place over or takes uh, place over the next two, two and a half decades. So 
by analyzing all of these factors, uh, city council um, ultimately decided that we would have an ambient temperature district energy sharing system, which is similar to what Jack's team uh, is implementing in Whitby. So uh, ambient system uh, would then also reduce the further energy consumption on site, and then additionally adds the flexibility uh, for tying in other renewable energy sources in the future as well. Now, ambient EE system combined with renewable electricity would be the perfect, uh, perfect uh, uh, potion for achieving the 100% uh, renewable energy goal at the end of the day. Now, talking more about the district energy piece, uh, in 2016, the site work started uh, on the construction and development of the district energy uh, field, as well as the piping network. So as you can see on the left is our first uh, 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 stormwater pond that's in Blatchford. Um, this pond consists of uh, 570 boreholes that are drilled to about 150 meters uh, deep each, um, which is roughly the size of a 30-story building. And at, at those temperatures, um, the, uh, at those depths, the temperatures are always constant, about six to eight degrees Celsius. And then this constant temperature then allows us to move the energy back and forth between uh, the geo field and the just energy sharing system. So ultimately in summertime, we dump uh, excess heat back into the ground. And then in winter months, uh, we access, access it again uh, to be able to heat the, heat the, heat the community. So essentially this um, uh, geo field um, acts as a massive battery uh, for, for the community. And then like Jeff had mentioned, it comes to the energy center one building. So, uh, this serves uh, as as a as a transfer point or or the middle nodal point between the geo exchange and the uh, distribution piping system going into the community. Essentially, where the uh, energy is transferred from the geo exchange uh, and then is upgraded by the heat pump that you see on the right. Um, this is a one megawatt energy heat pump and uh, definitely the biggest in Edmonton, if not Alberta. Um, and then from there on, once the community needs are met on the temperature set point, then it is pushed out into the community through the district um, piping system. Um, we had to start from somewhere. So uh, the map on the left shows us the implementation and the area of stage one. Uh, as you can see, there's the geo exchange field, there's the energy centers, there's the community uh, distribution network. And then that was stage one. And now we're moving on to the right, which is gonna be a full build out for the next 20 to 25 years. Um, and as you can see, there will be multiple energy centers serving um, different areas of the community itself. And all of these energy centers are going to be connected uh, with each other and will support each other's loads and uh, assist with meeting the community needs. And then also um, this nimble approach of development uh, um, leaves us open uh, to adapting to the uh, rapidly evolving um, world of renewables as well, because as the investment in the renewable energy grows, um, we would also want to build the system in phases to be able to adapt any new technologies. Um, the image, yeah. So, and then the next is all of this gets tied together um, with the Blashford Renewable Energy Utility. So, being a municipally owned um, utility. Uh, which means we are not regulated by um, Alberta Utilities Commission, like ADCO uh, or any other uh, gas utility. Council is our 
um, um, driver in in making all of these uh, co commitments and also the direction guidance. So at the end of the day, um, they're the ones that operate, uh, uh, assist us in managing and operating the utility. As a result in 2016, the BREU team was established to manage all of this. And generally speaking, um, the renewable energy also comes at a cost. Uh, so therefore, city council, as part of their fiscal policy, mandated that any customer in Blatchford uh, is not going to pay any more than the, that they would pay elsewhere outside of Blatchford limits. So essentially, anyone living in Blatchford is going to pay at most comparable fee to what they would pay elsewhere outside of the city to make to make uh, to make this um, vision come to life. Um, partners, um, building and operating such a system, such a utility is a very collaborative effort. And uh, the council uh, vision for the community and their involvement also shows that they are committed to achieving the vision and uh, we rely on our external partners, as you can see a bunch of them on, on the left here. Um, FCOR being one of the ones that we use for billing purposes uh, for the utility. Some of the challenges and the opportunities, um, again, very uh, capital cost intensive to begin with. Funding gaps uh, is also another one. And uh, market acceptance, like the education piece that Jeff had mentioned is is huge that we had to overcome or we are actually overcoming especially in a pr province that's known for oil and gas industry lastly um, the ability uh, to incorporate and showcase any new emerging technologies and then also these significant reduction in the GHG gas emissions uh, along with just the opportunity for us to provide uh, this platform and showcase Edmonton as, as a leader in the renewable energy is, is amazing. So planning for future, um, the city council's vision, the mandates all put us in line to what the environmental strategies area within the uh, corporation has done. And this also reaffirms the commitment to fighting the uh, uh, issue of uh, climate change and reducing the GHG emissions. With that, I thank you. And um, if there's any other questions, feel free. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Samir. I appreciate that presentation. Uh, very informative, very interesting uh, project. So without uh, any more, um, without taking up any more of the time I'm going to get right to questions because I know we've had some sitting here waiting. Um, there was a actually there was a comment that came in during the presentation that said the long uh, lead time that Jeff speaks about I would think that as these systems come on board and prove out word will get around and the lead time will diminish. That's my hope anyways. <laughs> More of a comment but I just uh, wanted to put it out there in case you guys would like to comment on that. Um, have you noticed the lead time diminishing as more and more projects um, come on board? Yeah, it's a, it's a great comment, Cassandra. And uh, yeah, to, to your point earlier, you know, as more of these systems become available and implemented, um, the, the resources, the staffing, the engineering firms, the turnaround times, the developers that are looking at this on day one, as opposed to later in the process, certainly going to benefit uh, the adoption of these systems moving forward. And hopefully those lead times will drop down, um, you know, accordingly. Mm -hmm. Uh, the following question is, this project is implemented in a new development, so I assume undeveloped land. This is actually true for both of you. Uh, do you think this kind of project is feasible in an already developed area? I can take that one if Samir doesn't want to. Um, yes, yeah, so, so both these communities are new developments. Um, district energy can be implemented in existing uh, applications that there are some additional challenges. 
um, to install the distribution piping, but certainly if it can be coordinated with other infrastructure upgrades, if there's a water main that needs to be replaced, that that would be the time to install district energy pipes. Um, and, and the challenge also becomes converting uh, existing mechanical solutions and the building loads associated with those mechanical solutions to a lower carbon, uh, lower energy heat pump solution um, if you're going that route. But there are other alternatives like biomass or CHP um, that can be used for redevelopment or, or existing applications. Perfect. Thank you. Um, how much heat are you producing from the initial energy plant and how many uh, square meters of building area will this satisfy winter heat loads? So maybe I can take that sure. one on as we're in operations, Jeff. Uh, so um, like I was saying, this is a very um, flexible system. Uh, the first energy center uh, is planned to have close to four megawatts of heating load and four and a half megawatts of uh, cooling capacity, uh, which is expected to sustain close to three to four uh, stages of development in Blatchford, which means, and again, that is dependent on, on, on what type of building uh, is being proposed by the builders to build if they're planning a high rise or if they're planning a bunch of um, apartment style buildings, the number of units. So it depends on uh, essentially essentially the, the type of uh, building um, uh, um, demographics as well. Right now we are working with uh, a couple of uh, multi-family site developers uh, and we have um, uh, fee simple townhouses connected to the current system. Okay, thank you. Um, did the municipality, and I think this again could apply to both of you, so uh, did the municipality have to change any bylaws or requirements for buildings to be built district energy ready? For example, allowing buildings not to have conventional heating and boiling systems requiring hydronic heating, et cetera. I can take that one because that's been a challenge for us here in Durham region. So um, yes, the Whip, Whip, town of Whitby has a Whitby green standard, um, very similar to the new uh, tiered energy building code, uh, national building code. Um, that's part of the challenges we're facing is, is current building code doesn't require um, a connection to an existing district energy system. There's no mandate or bylaw that requires customers to connect to it. Um, so we really have to express the value of connecting to it versus doing business as usual. Um, but certainly to Samir's point earlier, building a better building drops that energy requirement. And really, when you look at it from a larger, larger perspective, um, you can heat a lot more energy, net zero energy or low energy homes with a single geo exchange solution than you can uh, conventional homes. So certainly those bylaws are challenging to negotiate um, and implement. There's regulatory requirements, et cetera, but uh, the building code adoption will help um, drive some of that change that we're looking for in the building sector to, to really implement a lot of these systems. And if I may add to that, uh, actually in uh, Blatchford specifically uh, because it's council um, driven project, uh, there was a creation of a new bylaw, especially for the Blackfield lands that was um, uh, put together and then approved, which mandates that any connection in Blackfield uh, must connect to the district energy sharing system, along with following um, the green building codes that were also specific to Oh, Samir, your uh, your mic got covered again. Sorry. Can you repeat just the last sentence? Yeah. So um, the council uh, mandated the connection requirements as part of the bylaw uh, creation and adoption, specifically for the Blasper team or area. Sorry. And then uh, along with the implementation of the green building codes, as well as the architectural guidelines that the builder uh, has to follow within the Blasper. Um, uh, service boundary. Okay, great. Um, can you talk about the ROI of projects, the return on investment? 
um, the projects was one of the questions. <laughs> we're, we're a little bit early in, in the development stage to, to have done a full economic analysis, but typically we're targeting uh, a, a typical utility type rate of return on these projects. So low, uh, high single digits, low, low double digits, and, and maybe in the low teens. Um, they are long-term infrastructure plays, so we're not uh, we're not in those large margin response, uh, like, you know, areas. But it's it's the steady cash flows and the revenues, and that's what really drives these these businesses home. It it is a, a bit of a risk from a capital perspective, but um, that that guaranteed the contracts and terms uh, allow for that uh, risk to be mitigated to to allow a, a let's call it a conservative margin. Great. Um... So uh, it's um, I'm thinking, oh, we only have time for like one more question. And there's a couple of questions here. I'm trying to get to all of the questions. But if I if we don't get to your questions today, we do have um, the uh, your we'll send out the emails so you can follow up. Is the Blatchford area planned only for residential development? And how do you manage the peak loads and heat exchange if all buildings have the same heating and cooling needs simultaneously? So uh, Blatchford area has a mixed uh, bag of buildings that is uh, going to be built. And there was actually a special zoning bylaw that was also put in place for mixed uh, commercial, residential. So no single families, uh, all high dense uh, residential, and then also any office space. Uh, so it'll be a city within a city, technically. And then we already have the uh, the LRT line that is going to be running in the in the community itself, um, which makes the uh, the the transit ride from the community to downtown core uh, under ten minutes. Um, so the community uh, is very accessible in that sense. And to um, tackle the the issue of of the peak loads, uh, currently uh, we have enough capacity to uh, adjust to any peak loads. But again, being nimble in our approach, uh, as the uh, load profile grows, along with the building um, uh, lots also growing, we will be looking for solutions and adapting uh, accordingly at the time. Okay, thanks, Samir. Okay, this is the last one really quick. What tools do municipal governments have in their toolbox to get commercial builders adopting district heat systems? This comes back to uh, prop, having a proper green standard that uh, either incentivizes or uh, enables developers to take that leap to go to that, that next level of, of performance and, and tie to these district systems. Uh, it really comes down to regulatory um, regulatory implementation and bylaws uh, like they've done in Edmonton, as well as those those higher tiered green standards that require, you know, expedited permitting or uh, developer incentivization by by reducing the, the development fees associated with going to that. Um, it, it's challenging, but certainly there is opportunity there to convince these developers to build these buildings accordingly and connect to that system. Thank you. Thanks. Um... So I am now going to pass things over to our Noemi, who will talk a little bit about uh, some of the funding opportunities here at GMF. So Noemi, are you with us? I'm here. Hi, Cassie. Perfect. Hi. Maybe just say next and I'll flip the slides for you. That sounds good. So I don't need to share my screen just to confirm. No. Can you see mine? I Give me a moment. I think I shared mine just in case. So we may have doubled up here. Okay. Sorry for the delay. No worries. All right. Um, oh, I'm so sorry about that, Cassie. I'm just trying to. I can have it so that you share yours if that's right, easier. Perfect. You can see it. Thanks. Sorry for the delay. All right. Um, so um, what I'm going to do today is give you all a little bit of a speed tour of our funding options in the few minutes we have left. So I work as a funding advisor with the Green Municipal Fund, which is our uh, largest funding program at the FCM. So we've been around for just about 20 years now. 
and, and very broadly speaking, we work across five sectors. So energy is our biggest one, I'd say, or at least our busiest one. And that's where I'll focus in today, given the, the topic of the webinar. But just quickly, um, in case it might touch on some of your work for some of you who are attending, we do also have funding for transport projects. So that could be active transport or projects looking at modal shift. Um, water, so stormwater management, wastewater management, potable water conservation, as well as solid waste management, so diverting waste from landfill. Um, and finally, land use. So right now, that's all focused on brownfields projects. And as you can imagine, there's often uh, lots of overlap across those sectors and projects that we've worked with. So if you have um, any projects where you think there might be some alignment, definitely reach out and we can see maybe there's a way that, that this funding can support your work. Um, so in terms of what those, those that funding looks like for dollar amounts, um, we can fund projects at a few different stages of the funding or the, a project life cycle. So if you're early on, we have funding for feasibility studies so that can include business case development, um, engineering studies, estimating the anticipated environmental benefits. And Jeff, it was neat to hear earlier on that uh, would be an Alexicon group had accessed some GMF funding uh, for the feasibility study for the project that you presented today. Um, so, so that funding can go up to a maximum of $175,000, and it's uh, just a grant, which is just great. If you're a bit further along, we have funding for pilot projects. So that's a grant of up to half a million dollars. And that's really for projects where maybe you're testing something at a smaller scale or a temporary test. Um, so, so we have funded a couple of district energy project pilots, actually. But I would say typically those tend to fall more into uh, studies or capital projects, because given the nature of these, these big systems. Um, and finally, for capital projects, we have a mix of loan and grant. So most of it is a loan. The grant is worth 15% uh, of the loan to really help um, offset the interest rate. So usually we're able to offer a really competitive rate in the loans that, that we have. Um, in most cases, the loan is capped at $10 million, but we've been able to approve a few projects that go well beyond that um, when there's a lot of really interesting elements to projects. So um, if you have a need for, for a loan that's within that $10 million bracket or higher, um, definitely let's, let's chat about it. Um, if you could jump to the next slide, um, I wanted to share a little bit more detail on the funding we have specifically for district energy. So there was a question about this in the chat earlier, and we do have a funding stream under our core energy offer that is really specifically designed to support these types of projects. Um, so that, again, can be at the feasibility study pilot project or capital project stage. And just a couple of examples of, of the types of projects that may be eligible. It can include energy generation from waste or from landfill gas. Uh, it can be the construction of a new system or, or upgrading an existing system. Um, although we do only support or, or focus on projects that are, are based on recovered or renewable energy. Um, or if you have an existing district energy system where you're looking to move away from fossil fuel use to a low carbon energy source like, uh, like residual biomass, that's something that could fit as well. Uh, or finally, combined heat and power, cogeneration or, or tri-generation systems. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to highlight one example of a project that we were recently able to provide some funding for. So I don't know if anyone here is in the Ottawa Gatineau region, but this is a, a project that we were able to provide uh, $23 million in funding for in 2020. Um, you may have gone past it if, if you're in that region, but it's a 34 acre site um, that sits on both sides in both provinces of the Ottawa River. So it's a formal industrial site being redeveloped for mixed use, so residential and commercial. Um, and the district energy system is going to be a core piece of trying to achieve um, what they're aiming for, which is a net zero site. So it will use um, cooling from the river, um, recovered energy from, from an industrial source, um, as well as um, locally generated hydroelectricity. So the objective ultimately is that all heating and cooling for the buildings on the site will be uh, at zero GHG emissions. So um, that was a big one and, and an interesting one too, because it fell across two provinces. So definitely lots of challenges there in terms of uh, you know, bringing together all the stakeholders. Uh, so I see we have literally two minutes left. So I will really speed through this one, but just beyond district energy, I wanted to highlight a few funding programs that we have for energy projects in case that touches on some of the work you may be doing. So under the CEF program, community efficiency financing, we have some funding for residences, residential homes and engaging homeowners. 
staff can support either municipalities or non-for-profit housing providers for either energy retrofits or construction of new highly energy efficient buildings. And finally, the Community Buildings Retrofit Program is looking at energy efficiency in um, sports arenas, libraries, other community centers like that. So that is my speed tour of some of the funding that we have available. Um, as I said, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think that Cassie put my direct contact info in the chat, which is great, um, or you can reach out to our general inbox here. Yeah, thanks.